This is a story of survival, perseverance and innovation. It has never been about science for science sake at the Morden. It is about decades of research to provide practical, proven solutions to problems facing farmers and their ability to produce the food we need to live. It was started by farmers to investigate disease. Most research institutes have, uh, I suppose, almost become divorced from the farming community. Uh, Morden has remained embedded in it. Our ability to convey the research side to the farmers in a, in a manner they can understand, I think is hugely valuable. An institution created in 1920 to face the challenges of the times at home is now a global powerhouse on a mission to spread the fruits of its labour to farmers across the globe. The vaccine's been a game changer to what we do here. We talk about the lack of animals on the hills now. I think without the Morden's input, the, the highlands of Scotland will be much more empty. For 100 years, bacteria, parasites and viruses have been under the microscope of this unique institution. The first century has brought unimaginable success, but the Morden has so much more to give. Farmers realise that, that what Morden says is, is what we're needing to do with any particular problem. And, and if Morden says it, then it's holy grail, we get on and do it. And it's always to our advantage. I've been involved in farming either directly or indirectly all my life. And uh, I think organisations like the Morden, you recognise as the, you know, the huge impact that they've had and the fact that it was, it's comes from a very practical base because it was farmer created. So you know that the connection there is with you know, the, the problems that farmers face every day. One of those daily problems faced by farmers is sheep scab, the most important external parasite affecting sheep across the UK. We run uh, 2,000 breeding ewes here at Sockland, uh, lambing outdoors. We have farms all around us and we have no sure way of knowing that our biosecurity is 100%. So there's always that threat that if somebody else coming on uh, with sheep, a neighbouring farm or an escapee, that that could then spread into our own flock and cause an outbreak in scab. Well, I think uh, in general, sheep scab is a huge problem, has potential to be a huge problem. Um, and I think, you know, from the monitor farm perspective here, we're really keen to get involved with Morden when we had some of the research work they're doing. So I think in general across the country, it still is a big problem and it's something that we want to try and make sure that we can control and also want to be in a position where we can identify flocks that have it as quickly as possible. You're constantly living in fear of an outbreak and there's got to be a better way of managing it than there has been over the last uh, we while, which is a costly and exercise, but also a bit of an unknown. So sheep scab is caused by a small parasitic mite that infests the skin of sheep. And in doing so, it causes a lesion on the skin and that's incredibly itchy. Um, and that causes the sheep to, to rub up against anything that they can find from fence posts to barbed wire to alleviate that intense itching that comes with the disease. As well as being very irritating, of course, to the, to the animals, it also has a, a, a strong welfare impact. So as the a, as a disease progresses, it's the, it becomes the only thing that the animal can, can occupy their time with. Um, and that, of course, then means that they can have reduced food intake. They can suffer from dehydration as well, mostly because they won't drink water, um, but also the lesion takes a lot of resources from the animal also. The parasite not only spreads quickly, there have been recent reports of mite resistance to the acaricidal treatments used to control scab, potentially rendering wholesale treatment of flocks ineffective. Mordun's really got involved um, trying to develop a diagnostic test um, for sheep scab, and that's really just to improve the way that we detect the disease. So at the moment the disease is detected by uh, taking a, a skin scraping from a lesional area and then trying to identify the mite under the microscope. 
but that can be quite challenging because many sheep won't have any obvious signs of scab and you might not actually be able to find a lesion from which to take a skin scraping. So the sensitivity of that technique can be very low and that's why we're pursuing a blood test uh, instead to give us greater sensitivity of testing. A lot of the research took place on Mull, with modern scientists working alongside local vets and farmers. The, the trial or pilot in Mull was you know, before the test went commercial and it relied on your know, bloods being taken and uh, analysed at the laboratory. We've, we've now moved into a sort of different world where a modern have, have leapt forward really and, and now have a pen side test which is now you know, under trial. This, this, this would transform things you know, completely. It would mean that uh, rather than waiting days for a result, you know, if tups or, or new sheep came on farm or hogs came back to the farm or croft, they could immediately be screened and you'd get an immediate answer and then you could either target treatment or you could avoid treatment and avoid the cost of it. That, that's a fantastic sort of uh, place to be. And it's an important place to be as well in protecting the efficacy of our drugs because we you know, more to have found resistance in scab mites too important injectables we use. If we overuse these drugs, we're going to lose them. And therefore, this test is a way of out of that problem. The development of a Pennside blood test for sheep scab is a real game changer for the sheep industry. It's obviously far more cost effective if you do the effective quarantine, use a blood test at the very beginning, work out whether that animal is actually infested or not, treat if necessary, and if not, you can release that animal being confident that you, you know it's not infested and it's not going to present a risk to, your, to the rest of your flock. At Sockland Farm, manager Peter Eccles is eagerly awaiting the sheep scab results for some new tops that have just arrived on the farm. So that's five minutes since yep. we took those um, blood samples. So we've got the results here for the sheep scab test. And you can see that both of these are clearly negative, the uh -huh. two tups. Here, yep. So you can see there's no red dot in the middle, which is, um, would indicate that we'd found the antibodies okay. against the sheep scab mite. So these are, are clearly negative uh, uh, test results. Excellent. So I can run these tups with the ewes now? Yep, exactly. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. understanding that just doing it in the laboratory at home was not going to be enough, you know, to do it in a centralised fashion. You had to be able to back up the farmers much closer uh, to where the livestock actually is in order to make the best possible impact. And you see that, though, now, I mean, challenging the, the way that technology can be used to deliver diagnosis much closer, to allow you to treat them much more quickly. That sort of follows through from that, um, that early recognition that you should take the laboratory back out to the field. The last century has been peppered with game-changing breakthroughs for the scientists at the Morden. I think the whole of uh, UK livestock farming we could be completely different without the Morden input. In fact, I think we talk about the lack of animals on the hills now, I think without the Morden's input, the, the highlands of Scotland will be much more empty. If animals are healthy, the businesses and families make a living. Now, if they're not healthy, folk walk away from it, they can't do it. And that, that, was, that was really probably the, how Morden started. It was a group of concerned farmers who were having big losses in sheep. Uh, and they, they couldn't understand it and they, they got scientists together and that's a hundred years ago. They, I mean, we're reaping the legacy of these people's farsightedness. I think the first breakthrough that had a huge um, financial impact on the sheep industry was the, was the development of the clostridial vaccines because there was two main problems with the sheep industry. In the early summer, particularly in a good year when lambs were thriving, you had a, a clostridial disease called pulpy kidney. And you'd be looking at your lambs in the morning and they were bouncing about very healthy and you come back at night and the best lambs were the dead lambs. And that was, that was really soul destroying. Apart from the financial impact, it was really hard on folk. And then it carried on, there was a similar disease called Braxy, which these lambs that we're seeing here today, at this time of year, they suffered from it again. A frosty morning, you would get huge unaccountable losses and 
it was impossible to do anything until the modern scientists came up with the clostridial vaccines. And that has changed, radically changed, the whole face of Scottish agriculture and probably UK agriculture. At one time, Braxy was estimated to be costing Argyle sheep farmers alone a quarter of a million pounds a year. When the Morden created the first Braxy vaccine in 1933, it was greatly welcomed across the farming industry. And another product to protect against lamb dysentery was in such demand that Morden had to license production to the Wellcome Foundation. One of the strengths of the Morden is that it is still a farmer's owned organisation, farmer owned and farmer run. And in the greater industry, everybody knows of the Morden and it's their favourite auntie. And you know, there are an, an awful lot of worthy charities, but Morden is ranking up there quite highly with folk who know, who know that their living depends on it. The governments have got to realise that with a healthy stock of livestock, we have a healthy industry and we have a huge impact on the environment. You know? if, if your animals are healthy, you require less of them to do the same job. And you always must remember that we are there to feed the nation and a hungry man's an angry man. The early pioneers who set the Morden up 100 years ago recognised that the, the whole entity is to feed the population. One man who has been feeding the population for more than half a century is legendary farmer and president of the Morden, John Cameron. So John, you've been involved with Morden for many years and in fact we're delighted that you're currently our honorary president. Tell me a little bit more about how you actually became involved. Well, you're right about the long years. The, the animal health part of my livestock business was, was so important um, and, and therefore the advice that we got from various sources, but from Morden in particular, uh, seemed to be to be something that I should be listening to and, and, and taking action on. And of course, that's why in due course, we ended up with a high health scheme and an animal health plan, uh, which was going along the lines that being advocated at that time by the college, by our own vets and by Morden. And it's eventually, I mean, it turned out to be the biggest single factor in, in increasing the profitability of my livestock business. But I go back a bit further in, in my respect for Morden is that uh, at a time when, when we had this wretched louping ill disease and, and, and our replacement ewe hogs, when they, when they came back from the wintering at a year old, they were, they were dying because of louping ill vaccine. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I remember one year we lost about 25% of our ewe lambs, ewe lamb replacements. And, and until uh, the following year, fortunately, you people produced the, the Lyping Hill vaccine. And immediately, our death rate went from, from being 25% one year down to 2% the next year. Yeah. As you know, John, I mean, Morden was started by farmers back in the 1920s, and it was farmers who took, I don't know, the opportunity to try and find out about disease, try and find out the cause of disease, and actually employ scientists to do that. So it's a very famous legacy that we have. It is, but you're, you're, you're going to have to keep going with it if you're going to maintain your popularity with Scottish farmers. <laughs> what we're needing now Really, we're, we're looking ahead and, and there's a possibility perhaps that, that one of the diseases we're going to have a compulsory scheme to tackle will be Jonas disease. It costs the industry a fortune and that, yeah. that's, that's been established. Yeah. But as you know, we've got difficulty with, with the diagnostic test for, for, for Jonas. It is a really difficult disease and as you know, it affects you know, cattle and sheep and, and other ruminants as well. But I think one of the big challenges is it's a very difficult bacterium to actually try to control and as you know once animals are infected then they don't recover so it is a, a test and cull situation. I know that and I appreciate that Drew. I appreciate the difficulties but you've never been frightened of difficulties <laughs> in the past. It would be easy to characterise the modern story as science coming to the aid of farmers but that would only be telling half the story. The modern success has been built on farmers helping themselves by funding the research that leads to the great scientific breakthroughs. In the early years, landowners, farmers and shepherds paid subscriptions to help fund the research. It's this direct connection between farmers and scientists 
that has been so critical in solving the great challenges of the last 100 years. If you've got sheep, I and mean, critically almost any treatment that you're giving sheep um, is probably more than related. <laughs> um, and, very, and people, if it's preventative, people won't necessarily recognise that because uh, preventative medicine is not, you, you don't, can't measure it. If it works, nobody remembers, do they? But so much of that is down to the modern and getting it right. And, it's, and the timing uh, and the understanding of what you're giving them. That, that is part of the package. And I would hope that you know, farmers remember that. It's not just about being given the package and saying, this is the answer. It is about being engaged about why it's the answer and the, the difference it's going to make in the long run. And that may be the biggest contribution. Another example of the Morden's appliance of science is happening today in the poultry sector. Egg-laying hens have been suffering for decades at the hands of a tiny mite. In a farm with 2.5 million laying hens, producing one and a half million eggs every day, or a mere 500 million eggs a year, the tiny mite is a major problem. I'm the senior partner and the chairman of the company, Glenrath Farms, which my wife and I started 61 years ago when we got married. I married a poultry farmer's daughter, and that's where it all started. A sheep farmer, you only sell your lambs once a year, and eggs, you sell them every week. So if you've had a bad week with the eggs, uh, you could maybe have a better week next week. But with the sheep, you've only got one chance for the year, and sometimes you get good years and bad years. Rearing egg-laying hens might have less risk attached than breeding sheep, but the industry is not without its challenges. Clearly the scientists have done a fantastic job for the industry as far as the diseases that we know about. There's always a new disease, we've always got a new disease, but the biggest challenge just now is red mite. Research into the red mite parasite at the Morden has been led by Dr Alistair Nisbet. Red mite is a, a parasite of birds uh, and it's been around on uh, wild birds for, well, a very, very long time, millions of years. Uh, it's quite evolved with, uh, with, with wild birds and it parasitises birds in their nests. Um, once we started farming hens and we started intensifying production, then obviously it moved into hen houses and became a parasite of, of hens. They're small insect-like creatures, but they're actually related to ticks. At Mordun, we first uh, developed an interest in, in poultry red mite in 2006, uh, and we started a, a vaccine development programme against uh, red mite at that point. Ultimately, we were able to show that, um, at least in principle, we could develop a vaccine that controlled poultry red mite in the field. That was a real breakthrough for us, uh, that we were able to actually demonstrate that in principle we could do that. We did that in 2011, 2012. Much of our research since then has been really trying to refine that vaccine and develop it into something that's commercially exploitable and useful for egg producers uh, worldwide. Like many farmers, Sir John Campbell, a long-standing Morden board member, is deeply appreciative of the impact of applicable research on the industry. Morden's a fantastic operation and I'm very proud to be part of the Morden because I, I'm so impressed by the work that they do. A fantastic team. I think the fact that it's self-financing, very little government support, and I think that makes a fantastic difference. The Morden's a wonderful place and with the beautiful facilities that they've got now, it's, it's an honour to be part of it. We couldn't do what we do without our relationship with farmers uh, from 
various angles, first of all our interaction with farmers to find out what are their big issues, what, what is the problem they want us to investigate. Um, secondly, they give us access to, to their animals, they give us access to, to their premises. For this programme we actually derive most of our parasite material from commercial premises um, and that massively helps what we do on a day-to-day on -day basis. Uh, and then thirdly, we continue that relationship with, with farmers all the way through our research programmes to make sure that what we're doing is relevant to them. If it wasn't relevant to them, they would tell us very quickly um, and we would certainly know where we needed to point our research. So that, that relationship is absolutely vital to what we do at Mordor. As it approaches its 100th birthday, the Morden's influence is being felt across the globe. Here in Western Australia, the Morden has been hailed as the saviour of the continent's sheep industry. Some farmers were on the point of being driven out of farming at the hands of the voracious, blood-sucking Barber's Pole Worm, the most deadly of the roundworm group of parasites. Barber's pollworm is one of the most important parasites of the gut of sheep worldwide, but it's a worm that particularly likes hot and humid and wet conditions, so it's a big problem in the southern hemisphere. This led to the development of the world's first vaccine for roundworm in sheep, Barbavax. When it was launched in Australia, the first batch of 300,000 doses sold out within 10 days through word of mouth alone. It was really exciting for us when we had the first batch of vaccines in boxes ready to sell in New South Wales, um, in New England, in Australia. And what we decided to do was to target the very best farmers. We wanted farmers who really knew what they were doing and who understood that it was a vaccine, not a drug against the, the barber's pole worm. We started using Barbavax about three years ago, um, not long after its um, introduction to the New England and um, we were involved in distribution of it in town so I used it myself in our own merino lambs to start with to um, see how it would perform. The vaccine's been a game changer to what we do here. We've seen excellent results in merino lambs where we've given them three drenches in a year on the program and that's under very trying conditions. It's the first time that anybody in the world has produced a vaccine for a stomach worm of sheep. So it's absolute groundbreaking stuff. And as far as the farmers in Australia are concerned, it's been a game changer because they've had so many problems with dealing with the, the barber's pole worm that uh, some of them were almost being forced out of business. And then the vaccines come along at the right time for them. At the end of the day, the profits that we make out of Barbavax will come back to Morden uh, so that we can reinvest that in science, which is again going to benefit us, the farmers. Several thousand miles from Western Australia, the Morden's impact is being felt in sub-Saharan Africa. For the herdsmen of the Maasai tribe, it's not the African wildlife they fear, it's a cattle disease that can devastate their herds. MCF is malignant cataral fever. It's a disease of cattle, uh, but it's unusual in that the virus that causes MCF, the viruses in fact that cause MCF, don't have cattle as their normal host. So Morden has been working on this disease for, oh, since the 1980s. In Africa, it is distributed wherever the wildebeest roam. So it's uh, sub-Saharan sub Africa, Kenya and Tanzania are obvious. People are well familiar with the, the wildebeest annual migration in that area. But also most of the southern part of Africa has other species of wildebeest which again carry MCF. So MCF is a significant problem throughout South and Sub-Saharan Africa. The virus, which is spread by wildebeest, can kill up to 30% of calves in a herd. Thanks to the work of the Morden, in collaboration with other scientists in Africa, a vaccine is now being trialled. Working here at Morden, we were able to show yeah, as, as long ago as 10 years ago, the, the virus actually protected cattle pretty much 90% in, against that challenge. Uh, working in the field more recently uh, with colleagues at the International Livestock Research Institute in Nairobi, they've been able to vaccinate their herd and they're showing again efficacy of the vaccine of 
better sometimes. Um, so really quite good. The important thing is to get the timing of vaccination right. You vaccinate the animals just before the, the wildebeest arrive and begin to calve. The local guys in Tanzania, the, the Maasai herdsmen, the villagers, are very keen to, to get access to the vaccine. I think the problem is at the moment it's still an experimental vaccine in the respect that it's not a regulated product, it's not commercially available yet. So the, they've seen the results that have gone on in the field and they're very keen to have that vaccine made available to them. It does sound, you know, sort of uh, slightly fairy ish doesn't it, to say that you can do this. Um, you know, recognising what the problem is, but actually coming up uh, with, a, with an answer that could really make the difference um, requires an enormous amount of knowledge and understanding of the environment uh, and the livestock. Because, and, the, and the challenge is then to get, to understand where to, um, to place that knowledge so that it has the biggest impact. I rather wish that uh, in the early days of Save the Children, we'd had that sort of connection. Because we often found that uh, with different cultures uh, and different lifestyles, trying to improve the health of women and children in, in that uh, community meant understanding their rural way of life and what they depended on. And if part of that was the health of their livestock, we didn't really have the knowledge uh, or the places to go to ask those questions. And of course, the modern one would have been the perfect answer. It's not just the lives of people in Africa that are benefiting from the work of the modern. Research and an emphasis on a collaborative approach to problem solving is helping to protect human health in Scotland too. This is Glenlivet in Murray. The area is owned by the Crown Estate Scotland. In recent years there have been cases of people becoming ill after coming into contact with a waterborne parasite that affects both people and animals. Tryptosporidium is a parasite which um, really is pretty much widespread in the environment. In most countries in the world, well certainly countries that are warm and wet where the parasite likes to live. Its um, main reservoir is cattle, um, particularly young calves, um, so a huge problem for the farming industry. It's a parasite that survives well in the environment, um, and this is where the other problem comes in. We haven't got a lot of tools to control the parasite with, there's not a lot that kills it. So on farm it's an issue, but also in the environment, if it gets into water courses, it can be a real issue in terms of the water industry and, well, obviously public health. I think there was a tendency to think that it was related to um, heavily intense grazing from sheep and cattle, but there was never really any um, uh, information to, to say whether that was correct or not. The Crown Estate Scotland was very keen to start, try and facilitate uh, work with Morden and with, with Scottish Water to try and find a solution. Clearly, if it was down to um, livestock grazing and problems associated with the way the agricultural activity was being managed, then we, we wanted to find the solutions. So cryptosporidium across Scotland is a problem for Scottish water. So when this opportunity to work with Morden, to actually put a bit of science behind what we believed was the problem, whether it was farming practices, whether it was large herds of deer in the area, or other wildlife issues, and land management such as forestry, uh, this opportunity to do a bit of investigative work and put some science behind the, the assumptions uh, was a great opportunity for Scottish water. Working in collaboration with the Crown Estate Scotland, Tenant Farmers and Scottish Water, the Morden was able to sample livestock, wildlife and watercourses to show the path of the parasite. The strains from the cattle, the sheep and the deer were all found in the water sources. It wasn't just purely cattle, there was actually some deer contribution to this as well, which kind of took the heat off the farmers a wee bit. This would have been much harder to solve without that access to farmers and the trust of the farmers. With the science established, 
Crown Estate Scotland and Scottish Water could now work with the farmers to put management systems in place to reduce the risk of cryptosporidium getting into the public water supply. Within Scottish Water we have a sustainable land management team and they, they worked alongside the Morden and the farmers identifying where they could put fences beside the streams to actually protect the water course from the animals getting into them and minimise the faecal contamination in that water source. We haven't had any cryptosporidium detections in the public water supply for quite some time now. The Morden's Appliance of Science working in collaboration to find solutions to animal, human and environmental challenges. I think there's a lot more awareness among the farming community about problems with crypto just in terms of general animal health, uh, health and well-being um, and also the problem it creates in water supplies. Yeah, I think um, all, we've always known the problems with cryptosporidium, whether it's animal welfare or public health risks, but this project really put some um, evidence behind how it's all interlinked. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's a win-win situation, yeah. this one, isn't it? Because when you think about it, you know, you've got the water quality you want now. The farmers are struggling less with a parasite that they were struggling with. I know a key to this, too, has been the fact that Morden have you know, been doing the work. They're trusted by the farmers. They've got the scientific uh, research credibility, and, you know, it's been a key thing to the success of the project. Yep, I would agree. Equine Grass Sickness Fund is only 30 years um, in existence, but as a disease it was only recognised a bit earlier than that as a distinct um, disease. But it has been hugely frustrating uh, because I'm sure that they thought that they were going to have a better grip of it, um, both its cause and treatment, than they actually have. Not all scientific mysteries are solved so quickly. One of the earliest priorities for research identified by the pioneers of the Morden was equine grass sickness. It's a disease that's still being researched a hundred years later. Back in the 1920s, I think uh, obviously horses were very important on farms for traction power and the grass sickness was identified quite early on as a major issue because it killed horses so quickly. And I think it was actually one of the drivers that uh, made tractors become on farms a bit more quickly because they were losing so many horses to grass sickness. It was a major priority for the farmers to try and find out what was causing the disease and whether they could get something, a solution to tackle it early days what they were looking at was whether or not there was some toxin involved. Um, obviously it's called grass sickness because it's connected to when the horses went out to grass, usually in the sort of spring or summer, and they thought perhaps it was something that the horses were eating um, on the pasture. The Queen's Balmoral Estate is home to an award-winning stable of Highland ponies. They're looked after by Sylvia Ormiston. I believe there's an unbroken line of Highland ponies since Queen Victoria times. The ponies are actually a very special part of the Queen's life here. However, they're a very essential part, being a working harness pony, hence this equipment that we're putting on board, to um, bring home the, the culled red deer. The controlled cull of the red deer has to be managed um, in the deer forest, and the ponies are the equipment to carry the beast off the hill. When the Queen comes up for the summer, um, one of the first things she likes to do is come and meet the new foals uh, that she hasn't met yet this particular year. And then when she's here for the duration, she likes to come and visit with friends and guests, etc., to come and visit the ponies. They're a big part of Balmoral. This much-loved stable of ponies has recently been afflicted by grass sickness, twice in a single year. We had Balmoral Lord born here. Uh, we lost him as a four-year-old. He was here for, I would say, a good time, not a long time. You know, he has left his already his legacy. He was a very, very lovely, loving young man, and he had all 
what we were really looking for, temperament, confirmation, etc. However, boom, it's gone. Hercules uh, was like Lord, he was in the process of being with his ladies at the time, it was during serving season for us. Um, he was in a field on his own with his mares over the fence from him and he was no bother at all, he was just going through his day-to-day -day motions. Uh, but because we were having a visit on the Friday from Her Majesty, um, he came in on the Thursday to have his shower and his prep and stuff like that and it was from then that we started to notice things weren't right. Um, so on the Friday when Her Majesty came to visit we were already at that stage where we were keeping him comfortable until Her Majesty got to say goodbye basically. I think so many people are involved and trying their very best coming in from all angles but it's like cancer. It's, it attacks you from all angles. There is, I would say, a perfect storm. You could have 11 ponies in a field and only one pony be affected. And why was that? Why did it only affect that one pony? Funding is what it's all about. We can't do it. We can't research without the money. However, the research needs to go down the right channels. This is where the interdisciplinary research, I think, could really help. One of the new initiatives that's happening with the Grass Sickness Fund this year, which is quite exciting, is they've launched a new fund uh, named after John Gilmore, who was the veterinary pathologist at Morden, who really championed research into this area. And the idea is that it will encourage younger people, maybe with new ideas, some innovation, to take out short um, scientific projects to try and look at what might be causing grass sickness and what we can do about it. I think, you know, we're not going to, to solve all the problems. Uh, as we've discovered in the past, um, the problems with having antibiotic resistance to things you thought you had under control. So managing some of the diseases that you thought the antibiotics were going to control is going to be an ongoing feature. And we, and we, will, we now recognise that that is a major issue and that vaccines in themselves will probably need to evolve as well. So I see Morden as being a very important, important part of food security and development of, uh, uh, of all of those range of both vaccinations, medications and understanding of, of livestock management. So there's plenty of exciting things going to go on there and I think they will continue to lead in that, uh, in that area too because they've got that very strong base to work from. Scientific development is characterised by perseverance and innovation, and Morden's unique position of being an independent research organisation owned and governed by farmers to promote the highest standards of livestock health and welfare is as relevant today as it was 100 years ago. Research takes time and money, lots of it. Based on the last century, the Morden will never lack support. If we can use our science to improve the health and welfare of our farmed livestock, then we improve our position within the environment, we reduce our carbon footprint, we improve, importantly, the health and welfare of our farmed livestock. The bottom line for all of us, of course, is that it improves uh, us as farmers in the profitability of our businesses. Research on animal disease and infections of livestock are just as important for the next hundred years as they have been for the past hundred years. The diseases that we're going to be tackling are different and they're going to be even more challenging, more difficult diseases to deal with and perhaps even more innovative solutions required. Some of the sort of key vaccines we use, you know, the, the clostridial vaccines that we take for granted, which used to kill thousands of sheep, they were actually created at Morden. Your understanding of your BVD, which is now near to eradication in Scotland. You know, so much of what we do depends on, on the scientists at Morden Edinburgh. I don't think I'll be around in a hundred years' time, but nevertheless, if, uh, if Morden can produce in the next hundred years what they've done in the first hundred years, then uh, we are going to have some excellent livestock in this country. Patently, my connection with the Morden has covered a few years now and it's always a pleasure to go back to the Morden and see 
how things are being evolved, and that's down to that amazing team in the Morden. Both the board, all those members, the people who ask the right questions, people who do the work, and the scientists put up a lot of silly questions for me as well. Um, but developing uh, all of that knowledge, which feeds right back into the, into the agricultural sector, and particularly our livestock farmers, uh, you have a lot to celebrate.